Chapter 7 The Great Adventure The lengths of the Roman road stretched ahead of Saul and his companions as they rode out in the sunshine. He climbed till he could look back on the city of Jerusalem, and all its buildings ringed round with the grim walls. The line of the wall was broken with many towers. On one of these the armor of some Roman sentry would catch the glint of the morning light. But Saul would barely turn his head to look back, for he was on urgent business. And it was outside that wall that he had stood consenting to the death of Stephen. Would the memory of that face never leave him? The road ran close by the hill Gibeah, on whose fortified crest his great ancestor and namesake had lived before the days when he was called to be the first of all the kings of Israel. King Saul had slain his thousands with sword and javelin in his battles against the enemies of Israel, but even he had never seemed more sure that he was fighting in the cause of God than was this young namesake, who was now dashing northward to make havoc among the disciples. Yet, even as Saul hurried on, the questions would rise in his mind. What was the secret of the calm, cheerful boldness of these strange people? They must be wrong about Jesus, and yet, was it possible that, after all, Gamaliel might be right when he said, Beware, lest you find yourselves fighting against God. Beyond Gibeah, Saul rode northward till the great mass of Mount Ephraim bent the road to the right. Saul would see laden camels coming up a road that ran in from the left, carrying goods from the Roman port of Caesarea. But he himself would keep the direct road by the hills of Samaria. He stopped to drink at the well of Jacob, and perhaps to sleep at a wayside rest house there, whence he would see the sun set between the Mount of the Curse and the Mount of the Blessing, Gerizim and Ebal but nothing except the need for food and drink and sleep would make him pause. The road was a busy one. A Roman colonial would pass, riding to his new station, with his retinue of horses and mules, the shaded palanquin for his wife swung on the shoulders of slave-bearers, the clattering guard of soldiers, horse and foot, behind. A caravan of men of the desert walking beside their camels wound southward, bringing bales of Damascus cloth for selling in the bazaars of Jerusalem. Then Saul came over the hills down into the broad hot valley of Jordan, with Mount Gilboa lifting itself on his left, and crossing the stream that runs from the valley of Jezreel on his left, Saul and his friends marched straight on, till at last he could look up the Lake of Galilee, with its busy encircling road joining up the fishing towns under the quiet hills dappled with flocks of roaming sheep and goats. If he had stopped here to linger on the lakeside and to ask the men who sat mending their nets about the Jesus who had sailed across its shining blue waters and preached from a fishing boat to the people gathered on the white beach, Saul would have heard such stories of love and healing as would have deepened his questions whether, after all, Jesus was the great pretender. The lake, however, with its quiet industry, its brown fishermen, and its brooding hills reflected in the bright water, could not hold him. To him hunger and fatigue, the lake and the hills, stream and bridge and road, were just obstacles between him and his goal, Damascus. Skirting the west bank of the lake past Magdala, and riding across the Gennesaret plain, he climbed the northward hills thrust out like gnarled roots of Mount Lebanon. Then turning east, he dropped again to the valley of the river Jordan, which he crossed by a Roman bridge. He would see the oxen dragging wagons up the hills, with the heavy solid wheels creaking and the driver shouting as he prodded the slow beasts with his goad. Then one ill-tempered ox, Saul might notice, kicked against the goad, only to drive the iron point further into his own skin. Day after day Saul pressed on. Higher and higher loomed the great ridge of anti-Lebanon, where the oaks clothed the high range and flecked the rock clefts with green. In the heat of the day he would look up over his left shoulder, and feel glad to see the white summit of Mount Hermon. From the melting snows of Hermon the streams ran down to make all the parched land glad. 
For three days that strong, majestic mountain of white peacefulness was his companion, gleaming pink in the dawn as he started each day, and silhouetted in royal purple as the sun set over its shoulder. The last day of his journey had at length come. In the hour before sunrise, the hour when the shepherd leads his flock from the fold on to the hills while the dew still fringes the cup of the anemone, Saul started out from the rest house with his companions. The dawn came up out of the desert land eastward, and the Hermon height glowed as they pressed forward over the volcanic tableland, which at last drops down on the plain of Damascus. The sun lifted slowly in the shadeless land. The hour of noon drew near, when the power of the sun is like a burden bowing the shoulders of the traveller. The camel caravans drew out of the road under the eaves of a rest house, and no sound of bells broke the burning silence that only seemed deepened by the hum of many insects. The travelers came over a crest of a low hill. The road stretched ahead of them across the plain of orchards, beyond which the walls of Damascus rose. A dream city, a mirage of the desert, she looked, as her roofs quivered, seen through the trembling air. It was the hour when all the world of the East rests, but the young campaigner was in the full flood of his boundless energy. Ahead was the city where he was to win his spurs. Feeling in his breast for the sealed and signed parchment of the high priest, he bent his head to the blazing sun and pressed on. Nothing, it seemed, could stop this scourge of the Nazarenes. But even as his next step was taken on that shoulder of the hill, at that next white corner of the road, he met his great adventure. He came to that moment that made all his life new, a moment that changed the history of the world. Suddenly, he tells us, and the experience is so sacred and wonderful that one dare not try to describe it in any except his own words, there shone from heaven a great light round about me. I fell to the ground and heard a voice saying to me, Saul, Saul, why do you persecute me? It is hard for you to kick against the goad. Who are you, Lord? I answered. And he said to me, I am Jesus the Nazarene, whom you are persecuting. I said, What shall I do, Lord? And the Lord said to me, Rise and go to Damascus, and it shall be told you there the things that are appointed for you to do. So Saul stood up, opened his eyes, and could not see. Damascus, the whole plain, the white crest of Hermon, the green of the orchards, all were gone. He groped, but could not find his way. As they saw his hands vainly reaching for a hold, those who were with him realized that he was blind. They put out their hands to his, and led him over the last league of his journey. Saul was shut in on himself. He could not look out on the sights of the roadside, nor return the glances of the curious peasants who gazed at this white-robed young rabbi being led along the road. There was only one thing that he could see, and it was burned in on his brain in that blaze that smote him to his knees. He had seen that vision after which nothing could ever be the same again, the light of the glory of God in the face of Jesus Christ. His brain, the mind that had been so confident of itself, reeled at the thought of what it all meant. Jesus the Nazarene was alive, alive, and had conquered him. Saul, the brilliant law graduate, the young rabbi, the rising hope of the Pharisees. Under his mantle he felt again that crisp roll, the high priest's letter to the synagogue priests, telling them to help Saul in hailing the Nazarenes off to prison. And now, there was no mistaking it, he himself was a Nazarene, newborn. He knew that Christ had given him birth to brother all the souls on earth. In that hour, when he staggered toward Damascus with wide, unseeing eyes, did an inner picture come back on him? A furious crowd outside the walls of Jerusalem, men stooping to pick up jagged stones, the air thick with missiles, a face looking up, and a voice, Lord Jesus, receive my spirit. Not even blindness could blot out that awful picture of himself, Saul, standing by, and backing those who were slaying Stephen and now he himself, like Stephen, was a Nazarene. The sound of the echo of his own footsteps told Saul that he was passing under an arch of the city gate. 
he heard the steps and voices of the crowds going to and fro up the footway, the grind of chariot wheels and clatter of hoofs in the road. He felt the cooler shadow of the covered way. Then his companions stopped, and knocked at a doorway which was opened. Saul was led into the house of a Damascene Jew, Judas. From the roof of that house a man making his evening prayer toward Jerusalem would see the sun dropping behind the purpling shoulders of Hermon. It was sunset in Damascus, but it was dawn in the life of Saul. End of chapter 7